This is part one of a several part series detailing Hyper-V, the same virtualization platform that powers Azure, its virtual machines, and Xbox. In this video, we're going to cover the installation and configuration of Hyper-V on a single standalone Windows Server 2025. The standalone server will serve to mimic a typical Dell, HPE, or generic server found in any data center. The Hyper-V server we are using has the following specifications. 20 Xeon Silver 4210R processing cores, 128 gigabytes of RAM, a 127 gigabyte SSD operating system disk, 32 gigabyte SSD paging disk, mimicking an Azure configuration, a one terabyte NVMe virtual machine volume formatted as NTFS, a two terabyte NVMe virtual machine disk volume formatted as REFS, and two 10 gigabit capable Ethernet adapters. The operating system is Windows Server 2025 Data Center. The actual hardware for this demonstration is, well, Hyper-V. Yes, we are installing and configuring a high-performance Hyper-V server inside an even more powerful Hyper-V host. We need to do some preparation. First, ensure your server's BIOS UEFI has its virtualization settings enabled. If in a virtualized environment, ensure nested virtualization is enabled. Now we're going to configure storage, but probably in a way in which you may not be familiar. With Server Manager open, click File and Storage Services, Volumes. Notice that the one terabyte and two terabyte drives do not have drive letters. You can also see this using disk management. For the one terabyte and two terabyte drives, we are not going to assign drive letters, but we're going to mount them into folders. Using disk management, right-click the volume area and select Change Drive Letter and Paths. Click Add, mount in the following empty NTFS folder. Navigate to the empty folder where the drive is to be mounted and click OK twice. Do the same with the other volume. Back in Server Manager, Volumes, click the Refresh button. Notice the volumes are now mounted to the folders. Open File Explorer and navigate to the root folder where the volumes are mounted, and notice the size field reflecting the volume's capacity. You may also notice the icon has changed. Alternatively, you can use the PowerShell Add Dash Partition Access Path commandlet to provide an access path. Later, when we install Hyper-V into a cluster, it will make sense why we mounted the volumes to folder paths instead of using drive letters. In Server Manager, click Manage, Add Roles and Features. Under Server Section, click Next, Check Hyper-V, Add Features. Click Next until you get to Virtual Switches. For now, leave the listed adapters unchecked. Under Migration, leave the defaults. We can change all of this later. Under Default Stores, we can now select our mounted locations. But for now, leave the defaults as we will change this later using Hyper-V Manager. Under Confirmation, check that the Restart Destination Server checkbox is checked and click Install. Likewise, we can use the Install Dash Windows Feature commandlet to install the Hyper-V role. Following the reboot, close the Add Roles and Features dialog box. In Server Manager, click the Tools menu 
and select Hyper-V Manager. Right-click your server name and select Hyper-V Settings. Under the Virtual Hard Disk heading, we will specify the location of the mounted folders for the virtual hard disks. Click Browse and navigate to the mounted folder. Do the same for the virtual machine's heading. Under NUMA spanning, it is best to leave the defaults unless you have a specific reason to change the setting. Under Live Migrations, since this is a standalone server, we'll leave the default settings. We'll cover Live Migrations between servers in a later video. The same under Storage Migrations. Leave the defaults. Leave the default for the Enhanced Session Mode Policy for the server, but the option to enable it is yours. Under Replication Configuration, again, leave the defaults as we'll cover replication in a later video. Under the Users section, leave the defaults unless you have a desire to change them. Click Apply and OK and close the Hyper-V Settings window. Right-click your server and select Virtual Switch Manager. You have three types of virtual switches, external, internal, and private. Click Create Virtual Switch. External Network. Here, we select the physical adapter that the virtual machines can use to communicate to an external network in the same manner as a physical system. Clicking the dropdown may reveal several adapters. However, it may be challenging to identify which is which since the adapter description is listed instead of the adapter name. Use the PowerShell get NetAdapter commandlet to see the network adapter's name and description easily. If only one network adapter has external access, leave the Allow Management Operating System to share this network adapter checkbox checked. When there are separate, dedicated adapters for VM external access, uncheck the checkbox as that prevents the host operating system from using that adapter. If the physical adapter supports the feature, check the SR-IOV checkbox. Provide a meaningful name and click Apply. Read the warning dialog box regarding losing network connectivity while changes are being applied, especially when configured remotely via RDP. You can only bind one external switch to each physical adapter. Attempting to use a physical adapter already bound to a switch will result in an error. Right-click Start, open Network Connections, Advanced Network Settings, and click the drop-down arrow for the external adapter. Click Edit under More Adapter Properties and Notice Bindings. Internal Network. Click New Virtual Network Switch, select Internal, and Create. An internal switch allows network communications between the host computer and the virtual machines. Open Network Connections, Advanced Network Settings, and notice there is now a V Ethernet adapter that allows the Hyper-V host to communicate with VMs connected to an internal switch. Private Network. Click New, Virtual Network Switch, select Private, and Create. VMs on a private switch and the same VLAN can only communicate amongst themselves and not with the Hyper-V host or external systems. Under the Global Network Settings section, MAC Address Range heading, you can alter the default values. By default, each Hyper-V host can assign 256 MAC addresses. If you want or need to obscure that the MAC addresses are Hyper-V related, the 00-15-5D OUI is well known, you can change the organizationally unique identifier, the first 24 bits, to an arbitrary hex values. Click Apply 
to commit any changes, followed by OK to close the window. Click your server name to see the virtual machines to which you have none. Right click your server, New, Virtual Machine, Next. Provide a name for your virtual machine and leave the Store the virtual machine in a different location checkbox unchecked. We'll discuss this in a later video. For practically all modern operating systems, select Generation 2. For startup memory, type 16384 to provide 16 gigabytes to the VM and leave the Use Dynamic Memory checkbox unchecked. In the Connection dropdown, select the external switch. For the virtual disk, leave the defaults. Select the operating system ISO. For this demonstration, I am using Windows Server 2022. Click Next, followed by Finish. Right click the VM, select Connect, and click Start. When booting with a Windows ISO file, hit any key to boot when prompted. If you waited too long, click the Action menu and select Reset, followed by Reset. During booting, the connection is in console mode. After Windows is installed, click the Action menu and select Control Alt Delete to log in. And yes, in Hyper V, we can install and run any Linux distribution just as easily as Windows. We have successfully installed and configured a standalone Hyper V server with running virtual machines. Upcoming videos will feature installing Hyper V into a three node failover cluster and advanced VM creation. As part of the Active Directory Domain Services series, we'll install another three node domain joined Hyper V failover cluster and manage it using System Center Virtual Machine Manager. I hope you enjoyed this video, learned something new, and found it useful. If you have any feedback, corrections, or suggestions, please let me know in the comments below. Please like, subscribe, and pass it on to others. And I thank you for watching.